Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Ann Baxter, Arts Manager at the Foster here in Palo Alto. And I first met Tony in the 1980s, not along a hiking trail, but at Montgomery Gallery, where a dear friend worked, and Tony was giving a talk after his John Muir's High Sierra journey. And I've been fortunate that our paths have intertwined ever since. Tonight, we not only have the pleasure of experiencing Tony Foster's artwork in the galleries in this remarkable space, but we also get to spend a little time with the artist explorer himself. I have some questions for Tony and some visuals which may or may not tie in with the flow of conversation. Uh, then I will read Tony questions which have been posed by you and submitted earlier this evening. For 40 years, Tony's work has been all about journeys. He has painted close to home and also far away. He has painted in the Himalayas from what we think is the highest point any watercolor has ever been painted to date, and, and also one of the lowest in Death Valley, and also, taking it a little more extreme, underwater in the Maldives, in the Indian Ocean, and the Cayman Islands and the Caribbean Sea. So thank you, Tony, for being here today as we reflect on your life of adventure and observation. And a little lighthearted, but also serious too, is Tony is actually completing a strenuous two month long journey this week. He's been in the United States since uh, the very end of May. And I hope, Tony, you can tell us about what you've been up to. <laughs> you notice, you notice that Anne is reading all her questions yeah. out. I've got the faintest idea what she's going to ask, and I, I don't have any notes whatsoever. Well, so, so, so if any of you have got any better answers than I give, then feel free to shout them out. <laughs> um, so what I've been doing for the last eight weeks, well, actually, this has been one of the hardest eight weeks I've ever spent, much harder than going to Everest or, or going to the bottom of the Death, Death Valley, because I've been, I've been sort of in public for eight weeks. So if I sound a little jaded, uh, you'll have to forgive me, because I've, I've given all sorts of lectures I've had. I had an exhibition opening in the Centre for British Art at Yale, which was obviously a great uh, honour and privilege. Uh, my, actually, my career as an artist in the US started, well, I don't live in the US, but I come here very much, uh, started really at the Centre of British Art where I had my first major solo show. Uh, and so this sort of felt like it had come full circle slightly because they offered me another exhibition which is still being staged at the moment. So I, there was an exhibition opening there. Then I had to go to Concord, Massachusetts, which was also sort of coming full circle because I had to meet my old, uh, very old now by the look of him, um, <laughs> uh, tra traveling companion, Parker Huber, um, to do a walk around Walden Pond like and, and uh, David Shendell, the filmmaker who's, who's making a documentary about me, uh, uh, filmed, filmed us like two old codgers meeting up after, after many, many years and wandering around the pond, forgetting half the things we were supposed to remember. Um, and so then, and then back to Yale to give a lecture, then flew over to uh, uh, Ketchum, Idaho, where I had another exhibition opening about 10 days after the first one. Uh, and that was a little exhibition of about a dozen paintings, 13 paintings actually, of an area called Copper Basin, which is up above in the Rockies. Uh, and that's a series of paintings I did about, uh, did last year, um, and started last year, finished them in my studio, managed to get them to the gallery in time, and the exhibition opened on time, thank goodness. Uh, and after that, I then went to raft the Green River uh, in Wyoming and, and, or in, yes, in Wyoming and, and moving into Colorado and slightly into Utah, where I was doing a, a small group of works for a project that I'm thinking of doing, uh, working towards as one of my next things. Um, and then back to Ketchum and then on to Cody, where I was artist in residence at the, um, at the Whitney wing of the Cody Museum, which, was, which turned out to be much less daunting and much more fun than I expected it to be. Uh, and then I came, where did I go after that? Oh yeah, back to Ketchum and then to here. So, so that's eight weeks and it's been pretty gruelling really, far more gruelling as I say than climbing Everest really. <laughs> I was going to ask you how uh, the last couple months contrast to your time uh, in the wilderness. You spend so much time in remote areas in isolation, for example, in New Mexico at the Monastery of Christ in the desert where nobody speaks 
or stuck in your tent in a snowstorm in the Himalayas. And this is a lovely picture of Tony with his wife Anne in Tywood Reef, England. So. Oh, well, <laughs> you, you can see there's some extraordinary contrast here yeah. on the screen. Um, <laughs> one where I'm ecstatically happy yeah. and, one where <laughs> and one where I'm completely miserable. But, <laughs> but, but um, uh, the question really was about, uh, I suppose, being solitary as opposed to, you know, talking to, talking to lots and lots of people. Uh, which is what I've been doing, of course, for t eight weeks. Um, and it's, a, it's an extraordinary contrast, really. But I do think that, that uh, I am quite used to spending long periods of time on my own. Uh, I very often, in the back country, will spend one, two, three weeks without seeing a single other human being. Um, and so, you know, I'm quite self-sufficient. I mean, the monastery that, that, uh, that uh, Anne referred to was, was um, in New Mexico, and it was a Benedictine order, and they accept guests, but the whole rule is that you're not allowed to speak. You're not allowed to make any noise whatsoever, um, and uh, except, I suppose, when you're chewing your dinner. Um, but, but the, uh, and so the day was spent in complete silence, and then after 7 o'clock it went into profound silence. And I'm not quite, I never was quite sure what the difference was, but, but in fact I found it quite quite um, convivial, really, because, as I say, I'm used to living in a tent in the middle of nowhere and not seeing anybody. So the idea that I could actually, you know, go into the monastery for my breakfast, into the refectory for my breakfast with all the monks, and then go back for lunch, and then go back for supper, and then, and then there would be a period after supper when the monks would uh, sing plain chant in Latin, which sounded fantastic and uh, very beautiful. And so to me that seemed quite matey really and, and the fact that nobody ever spoke didn't really affect me very much. I know some people can't stand it but, uh, but I quite enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking of time alone even underwater or <laughs> short periods of time or in the pressure chamber or... Yeah, well, no. yeah, I suppose. But I mean, of course, when you're diving, you're not supposed to be alone anyway. I mean, you're supposed to have a buddy with you. Although, of course, you can't talk, but you can make signals, you know, that yeah. kind of, <laughs> or that kind of signal. <laughs> uh, and so, um, but I did find, of course, that when I was sitting on the bottom of the, uh, 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 40 feet, doing my, my, doing my drawings and things, uh, of course, my buddy used to get so bored with just sitting, watching, you know, being around and around, making sure I was still alive, that he used to go off anyway. And, and, uh, and of course, the thing about actually sitting when you're diving is you're not using as much air. And so, therefore, I could sit there for 70 minutes, 80 minutes, and everybody else would have gone to the surface, and the boat, the boat crew would be kind of looking out, thinking, where the hell is he? And, and I can remember once I was sitting on the bottom working, and uh, a snorkeler, came past and spotted me on the bottom and, and rushed up to the boat and said, there's a dead guy about down, in, <laughs> down there. And the, and the boatman said, is he blowing bubbles? And she said, oh yeah, I think he was blowing bubbles. He said, oh no, that's only Tony, he's doing some drawings. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, but then that's only an hour or two of silence. That's fine, I'm used to that. Uh, and, so and, what is it uh, yeah. about the lifestyle that is so revitalizing that you do that? Is it the contrast between being at home and relaxed and going into extreme yeah. environments? I think it is the contrast I, because where I live is, is an absolutely wonderful little village. Um, all my, well, not all my friends of course, but, but we're friends with, with most people in the village. Our village pub is just across the road. Everybody meets there on a Friday evening for, to you know, learn the gossip and to have a good chat. Uh, what, the, what the Cornish call a crack, have a good crack, we call it crack. Uh, and, and, and everybody meets there, we have, you know, the Cornish choir sings there sometimes, and it's the centre of village life. And we, we've been there 45 years, and we're well embedded into the village. Um, but interestingly, uh, what I do in a way is, is very much what a lot of the men in the village do. A lot of them are either in the Merchant Navy or the Royal Navy, or they're on oil rigs, or they're hard rock miners who are scattered all over the world, or they're engineers. So they travel an awful lot and they're away for months at a time. And in a way, I do the same. And so people just think of me in that way. And so when I get back to the pub, you know, they say, had a good trip, Tony? And I say, yeah, good trip. And they go, oh, great. Uh, I've been away long. And I say, yeah, well, two or three months. And they say, must be your round then. And that's, <laughs> and, and, that, and that's as much really as you get out of them. But, but, 
but, but they, they do come to my exhibitions and have a good time because, of course, they can't get used to the idea of free booze. So, so, <laughs> so, so they always come to the exhibition openings in the UK, but, um, uh, and some of them actually have been here too, so, so they're, they're very supportive, really. And tell us how you got onto this path. In um, 1979, you did a four-day walk of 48.7 miles, and in 1981, a four-day walk of 56.4 miles, and we think that's kind of the beginning, the start of your life of journeys. Yeah, how far back do you want me to go? Uh, <laughs> well, I think it's interesting what I'm... you did uh, with the British Arts Council. I think uh, okay, was... well, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd, al I'd always been a, every, I, w I was always good at art, no matter what else I did. I, art was the only thing, really, that I was much good at. Uh, and I, I guess I'd always done it since I could pick up a pencil or a paintbrush. Um, but uh, I never, ever thought of it as a career. I, I, the idea that it never occurred to me that you could have such a career as being an artist. Uh, and I went to a very formal boys' grammar school, which didn't suit me very well and left kind of under a cloud when I was 16. And that was pretty much the end of my education. Um, and, but then gradually, um, I sort of got back on my feet, as you might say, and, and uh, had a job with, the, with like the regional wing of the British Arts Council. Um, and my job was to go around and, and uh, talk to people who wanted to start galleries or talk to people who wanted to start craft shops and that kind of thing and help them to, if they needed uh, assistance, try to help them to get the thing organized and uh, you know, give them advice about what exactly they needed and perhaps to some of the craftsmen and artists they should represent or talk to. Or, uh, and so my job was really basically to give advice. Um, and what I found was that no, the last thing artists actually want is advice. They didn't want advice. What they wanted me, what they wanted me to do was give them money. And, and, and I was, that was part of my job, was to organize grants for artists and that kind of thing, which were all done through panels of experts who would vote for who should get grants and who shouldn't. Um, and that was my job, to organize that. Uh, but I realized that they never, ever took my advice. And so I thought, well, damn it. Uh, you know, I'm an artist too. Why don't I just take my own advice? And my advice was that if you've got something which you are going to devote your life to and you're confident about, you ought to be able to go out into the world and talk to people about it and express your enthusiasm and get other people enthusiastic. Uh, and I always used to say, look, there's, there's going to be no fairy godmother come to your studio and wave a magic wand and make you rich and famous. You are going to have to get out there in the world and you know, develop, pe develop friendships and develop associations with people who are interested in what you're doing. Uh, anyway, nobody ever listened to that. So I thought, well, I will. I'll listen to it. And, and so really that's how I developed this way of working, but, but I was, at that point in my life, I was a pop artist. Um, and I'd, I had had a couple of quite reasonably successful shows as a pop artist, uh, not financially successful, but people had taken a bit of notice. Um, but I began to realize that actually that was wearing a bit thin, the idea of pop art where you take imagery from uh, all sorts of media sources, basically. You use advertising, you use you use uh, uh, comic books, you use shots off the television, you use all, all current media is kind of grist to the mill of the pop artist. And there were some wonderful things done. I mean, I loved it. I absolutely loved pop art. But, but I realized that that secondhand imagery thing was wearing a bit thin, really, for me. And I started to think about, well, perhaps I should do paintings about things I actually care about. Because my paintings at that time were about American football, about which I know nothing and care absolutely nothing. Um, but it, but what, what excited me about it was it it's was nice vis <laughs> visually very exciting. Uh, you know, the clash of those, those wonderfully colored shirts. I didn't care who was in them, but the, but, but the actual clash of the shirts and the, and the helmets and the whole kind of armor that they put on and the way the shapes, they made shapes in the fields and things, I thought was interesting. But like I said, I didn't care who won, lose, lost or drew, but... but, but uh, it was that, or it was hot rods, about which I don't know very much either. I mean, I know how to mend a car, but I didn't, I'm not about to chrome plate my engine. And, and, and so it was all about sort of American subjects. Even Richard Nixon entered into a few of my paintings at one point. Um, and then I thought, I, I'd never even been to America. Why the heck am I doing all these 
paintings about America. Uh, and so I thought, this is not me, really. This is just me taking on this, uh, this thing. And so I thought, well, what do I care about? Well, I care about the environment. Uh, I've always been a conservationist and environmentalist and cared about that quite passionately. I like adventures, and so that seemed interesting. I like to go hiking. I like to be outdoors. Um, and I like to paint. And I thought, I wonder if I could combine all these things into the subject matter of the paintings I want to do. And so I started off doing these paintings, which Anna referred to, just short two, three-day walks across Dartmoor or around the coast of Cornwall or whatever, and doing uh, really basically what I still do, but a slightly less refined version, perhaps, um, and watercolour diaries. And the whole thing seemed to develop from that point on, really. I realised that people actually were quite interested in, not just in the little landscape paintings I did at that time, which weren't particularly distinguished, but, but, but were interested in the stories I told them about how, you know, I heard this tremendous scraping noise when I was camping once. I had my head out of the tent because I was with two friends and we only had a th the three of us in a two-man tent. And so my head was stuck out in the, in the drizzle and I heard this tremendous kind of grinding noise. And I thought, what the hell is that? It sounded like some enormous monster somewhere. And then I was looking around. I couldn't see anything. I got my headlamp out. Couldn't see anything anywhere. And I realized it was a slug had crawled into my ear. And, <laughs> and, 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 and when I pulled it out, of course, it was silent. And, and, and it's that kind of story that people loved. And I, th I, thought, I thought, well, I should just incorporate, the, incorporate what happens in a written diary in the in the whole story of the work, of the painting and people seem to respond to that mm -hmm. so that led to your first more major journey travels without a donkey in this event and why no donkey i was curious why no donkey <laughs> uh, well because i'm not daft that's why um we had been offered a donkey my friend james revilius who you see he's a very poor photograph but that's james revilius on the left hand side who was a, who was one of Britain's finest photographers. Um, he died. He took this photograph of you. Yeah, he, he took. Uh, he died about um, 16 years ago now, I guess. But I miss him dearly. He, he um, uh, and he and I did that journey together. He took 22 photographs, and I made 22 paintings. It was, I think, a three and a half week journey through the Cévennes in France. And um, the French embassy actually offered us a donkey. Would you like to take a donkey if you want to retrace Robert Louis Stevenson's? Anyway, we did some inquiries and we discovered that there was this very clever farmer in uh, Le Monastier, which is where the journey starts, who had a donkey, which he would hire to people who wanted to retrace Stevenson's journey. And this donkey was a kind of homing donkey because it would, he, he would charge you for three weeks or however long you were going to be, which was quite expensive. Uh, and then uh, the donkey would go for a day and then it would dig its heels in and that was as far as it would go. And then, so you had to phone the farmer up, he would come with his truck, he would charge you extra to take the donkey home again, and, <laughs> and then he would rent it to the next poor suckers that came along. <laughs> and so we declined the donkey, but I don't know if you can see it, but we decided to use a golf trolley instead. And so we dragged that golf trolley up and down the, uh, the Massif Central in France, um, mostly containing James's stock of, of uh, film. Uh, because he used a tremendous amount of heat and, and, uh, and that was very heavy at that time because you don't use it now but at the time it was heavy and so we carried our camping stuff mostly on our backs and stayed in barns when we could uh, but camped when we didn't find anywhere else to stay and we had a very good time and we did an exhibition together in London um, which, which caught the public imagination. So that led you to seek out Walden's Pond and explore Thoreau's country in the northeastern United States. And uh, what is it about nature that compels you? And then I was thinking it's, it's hard to describe, but what draws you to these journeys out of doors? And in many cases, not exactly the northeastern United States now, but other areas that are quite desolate. Yeah, well actually, um, it was this particular journey. What happened was, uh, I was offered this show at the Center for British Art um, and Duncan Robinson, the director, said, what would you like to do a show about? Uh, and I said, well, I, you know, I've always been a fan of Henry Thoreau. Um, being an old hippie myself, I, you know, I, he, he suited my philosophy. And so uh, I said, I'd like to retrace Thoreau's journeys. So 
at that point, I hadn't really focused on the idea of wilderness. I simply focused on the idea of being outdoors, basically. Uh, and so wherever Thoreau went, I went. Obviously, I started off in Walden Pond, and then I canoed the Concord and Merrimack River, and then I went, and went to Cape Cod, where he went. And then my friend Parker joined me and, uh, as a guide, because he was one of, the, one of the world's great experts on Henry Thoreau and where he went. And we canoed then the Allagash and the Penobscot and Moosehead Lake and all around that thing, climbed Mount Kineo. Um, oh, is it Katavik? No, Kineo, that's right. Um, and, um, and, and it was at that point that I realized that wilderness existed. Wilderness isn't really a European concept because every square inch of Europe has been fought over, bought and sold, owned by people and still owned by people for hundreds or thousands of years. And so the idea of wilderness was completely foreign to me. And so when we were canoeing, you know, the Allagash and the Penobscot and so on, it suddenly occurred to me that, that here were places which seemed, I know they weren't, they had been, you know, gone through quite carefully by lots and lots of people, but they had the feeling about them that they were untouched, that, that really people hadn't really made much of a dent on the place. And that, to me, was a profound change in my perception. Uh, and since then, the whole question of wilderness has been right at the absolute heart of what I've done ever since. This idea that there are untouched, unspoilt places, which you know, are profoundly beautiful and which should be left alone, in my opinion, um, and left alone just for the health of human beings to know that these places still exist. And, and, um, and so uh, that was a game changer for me, that particular show. And so what do I love about it? Well, I guess I just love the idea that there are these places in the world that nobody has, has yet managed to destroy. Mm -hmm. Being out in these areas is not all easy. Can you describe some of the difficulties you've encountered on some of your expeditions? Oh my God, that's quite a list. <laughs> in addition to the slug, that's one. <laughs> uh, well, of course, the reason places are wildernesses, or one of the reasons, especially in poorer countries, is that nobody's yet found a way to live in them um, or exploit them. And the reason for that is they're either too hot, like deserts, too cold, like mountains, uh, and too windy, like mountains, too dry, like deserts, too wet, like rainforests. Um, uh, so there are, there's something profoundly difficult about being in these places. Otherwise, there wouldn't be wildernesses. If they were easy to live in, people would be living in them. Uh, but they're not. They're very, very difficult to live in. And, and so all of them have their, their problems and difficulties if you're going to spend long periods of time in them. If you're going to spend long periods of time in a desert, you have to think about where, is the where are you going to cache your water? How are you going to get between one place and another? What happens when you're walking from one water cache in the desert to another water cache in the desert, and you arrive and find that mice have chewed the bottom corner off the container and there's no water left. You have to, you have to prepare yourself for those kind of difficulties. Or what is it in, like in the rainforest where, where your belly button grows green mold, where, <laughs> and you, you have to put athlete's foot powder in it to stop it doing that, where all your clothes rot, you're wet the entire time, your watch stops, your camera stops, nothing works because everything fills with water and muck. You're bitten to death the entire time. It, for every moment of a 24-hour day, there is something designed to bite you. And, <laughs> and, and it is merciless and it's non-stop and you have to get used to that. Most, most wild places I've found, you get you know, high mountains or wherever it is, most wild places you get used to in about a week or 10 days. But a rainforest, I reckon, takes three weeks for you to even feel slightly comfortable in it because everything is just against you. Uh, you know, trying to do watercolor paintings in a rainforest, it rains tremendous torrential rain, 20 minutes every hour. And, and it's just remorseless. And it can get you down if you're not careful. If you're not a cheerful disposition, it gets you down. <laughs> um, and so everywhere has its, has its problems, really. But on the other hand, it also has enormous rewards. Uh, rainforests are fascinating places to spend time in. Uh, and, and mountains are beautiful places to spend time in. Just the sheer, um, untouched beauty of a mountain 
it takes your breath away. Uh, and deserts too, beautiful, beautiful places, but probably only, say, from dawn for about two, three hours, and then two or three hours before dusk. The rest of the time, they are hell. <laughs> but for those two periods of the day, they are exquisitely beautiful. And so I guess, you know, no reward without difficulty, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So those are dangers that you kind of prepare for, but then there are other things that, well, I guess with the mice eating the water cache, that's something that just goes wrong that you don't expect. But I was also thinking of the time you were shot at. That's in one of these paintings right behind us. Right, yes, yes, you're right. There are two kinds of, there are two kinds of difficulties. One is the kind of difficulty that you sort of can prepare for, uh, and you can, so far at Touchwood, I've managed to kind of get my way out of. I mean, there have been occasions when, um, when I, I, I knew that if one more thing went wrong, then probably we wouldn't survive. So there have been that kind of occasion, but you can, if you keep your cool and keep your common sense about you, so far, <laughs> we, I've got out of it, and my, you know, we haven't lost anybody yet. But, but there are dangers which come upon you completely unexpectedly, which you can't prepare for, like when I was working on Cabazon Peak in New Mexico, uh, right out in the desert, uh, somebody with a rifle shot at me. And I could hear these three times, I could hear these three bullets go whizzing, whish, 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 like that past my head. And so I knew they must be close. But, and I often wondered what would happen in that kind of circumstance, what I would do, because you can't prepare for it. It's just come a complete shock. And what I did was, I thought, well, they were pretty close, but I bet if he'd meant to hit me, he would have. So he's probably just doing it for fun. So, so I just carried on drawing. Um, but, and in fact, sure enough, he stopped, whoever it was, or she, I don't know who it was. Uh, I never found out. Um, or when you're charged by a bear, uh, which does happen, has happened a couple of times, or by white lip peccaries in the rainforest, which are much more dangerous than any bear, or not, perhaps not as dangerous as a grizzly, but a, a, um, a herd of white-licked peccaries are the most dangerous things in the, in the rainforest, really. Um, and when you're charged by them unexpectedly, or charged by a bear unexpectedly, then you have to respond. And uh, you can't just stand there, because you'll be toast. And so uh, what I did was just instantly picked up my sketchbook, put it above my head, and rushed back at them, shouting obscenities at the top of my voice. And that seemed to work. Uh, I mean, they, <laughs> I don't know if they understood English. Perhaps they did. But, 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 but and so you, it depends what the danger is. I mean, I always say to my wife that actually more, statistically speaking, more accidents happen in the home. Than, uh, <laughs> but that's just statistically. Um, <laughs> But anyhow, uh, and it's not quite as dangerous as people think. I mean, I've been on, I don't know, maybe I've been on a, a hundred expeditions now. I don't know, I've never counted, but it must be a lot. Perhaps you'll count for me. That would be interesting yeah. to know. Um, of course, it depends what you call an expedition, I suppose. But, but um, I've been on a lot, and I've been, I suppose, in mortal danger uh, five, a handful of times, five times maybe, uh, and kind of in, in utter discomfort many, many times. But, but uh, seldom got to the point where I thought I might die. But I have a couple of times. Was that an answer? Well, that what was a great was. answer. What was the and question? Also, well, just the positive encounters far outweigh those experiences. And then Tony, when he works in the wilds, he's still for quite a long time. So just being still for hours and hours, you have more encounters with wildlife than yeah. normal because you aren't walking through people. Yeah. I mean, the species come to you. Or he was in the Sea of Cortez and was talking, or wrote in his diary about manta rays, um, many breaching right around you on yeah. your kayak. Nobody's quite sure why they do that. And, and the manta rays meet in the Sea of Cortez to breed. Of course, you see them underwater, and they're like, they're like Vulcan bombers moving sedately through the water. The most beautiful movement. Um, and then, but they would come rocketing out of the water in front of us, it, uh, just completely out of the water and then crash down in front of our kayaks. And nobody's quite sure why they do that, but they do it in the Sea of Cortez, but I don't think they do it anywhere else. So it's wonderful to see that sort of thing. But I think what Anne was referring to as I was talking earlier, that um, in the rainforest, because I was sitting still, I sort of became part of the forest in a way. 
and I would have a, a lizard sitting on each thigh, um, which would be catching the insects that came in to bite me. They, they realized so I was it's perfect. It's a good symbiotic relationship. Yeah. It was, I was perfect bait, really. And so the insects would be coming in, the, 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 the lizards would be sitting, snapping them up as, as they came in, and I'd sit pa painting. And then, and then a, a giant anteater came strolling across the forest floor with his huge nose, and it started sniffing at my boots, and, and then decided you know, they weren't edible, and so moved on. And a, and a pair of giant tapirs, which are like the South American version of, a, of an elephant, really, with a huge long snout. Um, they wandered into the kind of middle ground of my painting, probably about, I don't know, 15 feet away, 20 feet away. Um, and they could, tell, they could tell that I was around because they were sort of sniffing. You could see they had their snouts and they were kind of sniffing like this to think, what the heck's going around here? But they got very poor eyesight, I think, because they didn't see me. And, at least they, they, did, they didn't take any notice. And then they just go, were, were reaching down branches and leaves and things and chewing them up and then wandering off through the forest. And when I got back to, I was staying in a research station at that time, when I got back and told the scientists that I, and they went, oh, I've been coming here for eight years, I've never seen one. And I said, well, <laughs> well that's because you walk through the forest and I sit in it. And, and I could hear them coming. I said, I can hear you coming 10 minutes before you arrive. So if I can hear you 10 minutes, the animals can hear you 30 minutes before you arrive. They're much more sensitive than I am. And so that's why you don't see these things. And I see them because I'm sitting still, quietly, just working. And so there are great rewards to actually not chasing after things, just waiting for them to come to you. Mm -hmm. So you've done a number of journeys and have a number of journey themes. And after your first three, which are clearly inspired by individuals, you admire uh, uh -huh. Robert Louis Stevenson and this traveling, and Henry David Thoreau, living simply in nature, and then John Muir. Um, he hiked uh, John Muir's High Sierra, and I heard Tony talking right after he completed a long leg of that. But then there have been many other journeys, and how do you um, select them, like exploring the Grand Canyon or ice and fire or searching mm -hmm. for a bigger subject? Well, I, I didn't want to be thought of, really, I suppose. I could see myself slipping into the position where I might be thought of as a kind of illustrator of other people's journeys. And I didn't want that because it seemed to me that the journeys I was making were personal to me. Uh, and so I deliberately then started to choose subjects which, which were journeys that I devised, which I found interesting on particular subjects or particular topics or particular themes. Um, which kind of held the exhibition together. It wasn't just a series of random, random ramblings across the surface of the earth. It was, it, they were always very carefully directed towards a particular idea. Um, and so, and one seemed to follow naturally from another. I mean, I did a series about the Grand Canyon because my great friend, Bill Brace, who used to be the chairman of the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at MIT, a great, one of the world's great geologists, uh, suggested I would go there and he would come with me and we would do a journey together in the Grand Canyon. Well, that was too good an opportunity to miss, um, to be hiking through the Grand Canyon. We actually hiked, at least I hiked about 400 miles, I think, of the canyon. He, hiked, he came and went, so he hiked less. But, but to, to travel through a place like the Grand Canyon with someone who was one of the world's great geologists was just too extraordinary an opportunity to miss. And so... Uh, and so that followed from the John Muir thing. And then after that, I was going to go and do a series about deserts. But what I found was, I did start that series, but what I found was that I was kind of slipping into mannerism. I wasn't looking properly because I thought I knew how to paint it, because I thought it was a bit like the Grand Canyon. The, co the colors were very similar, the landscape, the, uh, the plants were similar, uh, and I thought I knew how to do it. And so. What I try and do is to stay fresh, and I thought, I, I'm slipping into mannerisms here, and I don't, you know, it, it becomes cliche, and I didn't want to do that, and so, and so I deliberately chose the most opposite thing I could, which was the rainforests, and so I worked on rainforests then, I think, for three years, um, and then after I'd finished the rainforest show, then I went back to deserts with a much, a f much fresher eye uh, about that, and from deserts I went on to um, volcanoes, uh, what happened there was, I, after, uh, my last painting in the Sea of Cortez, as part of the Desert series, um, I was sitting painting these wonderful, 
this thing, wonderful thing is called the boojum trees, which are the most extraordinary looking trees you've ever seen in your life. And elephant trees also, which are just wonderful bulbous things in the desert. Um, and in the distance was this wonderful little hill like this. And I thought, this was the, the little eye catcher in the painting. I thought, this is perfect. You know, there's a wonderful little eye catcher right on the horizon. And then I thought, why is that so even? Why does it look like that? And then I thought, well, of course, it's a volcano. Volcanoes! Why don't I do that next? So things seem to <laughs> things seem to follow a natural progression. Either the idea comes to me straight away, or I'm kind of laboring over it for a bit, and finally it emerges. But uh, the, the the exhibition called "Searching for a Bigger Subject," which was about comparing Mount Everest and the Grand Canyon, I thought the world's two greatest icons. That came from me being in the Grand Canyon and finding uh, a water bottle that somebody had either lost or discarded with a little canvas cover on it that said on it, Mount Everest. And I thought, that's really weird. What's this Mount Everest thing doing in the Grand Canyon? And I thought, whoa, wouldn't that, make a, <laughs> wouldn't that make a fantastic exhibition? And of course, it did make a fantastic exhibition. It, 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 it was one of my greatest, I think. So, so um, yeah, so either they just come from the ether or you know, something prompts it. I don't know where they come from. And then the question naturally arises about these journeys. Like, how do you know when a journey is complete? Watermarks might be your largest collection of journeys. That's 80, 80 artworks in that journey. There's Ice and Fire, which comprises 58 artworks. John Muir's High Sierra is 41. The Whole Salmon is 27 paintings. And then to, we have two complete journeys on exhibition here at the Foster. Sacred Places includes 36, and Exploring Beauty is 53. Artworks, just to name a few. Right. So you've been quite prolific. I'll say. But we're wondering, like, when no do you, when you know when to stop? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, when, when, when how do know, I know when, you know when it's, it's complete? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. It's just a sense you have. I think when I'm when I'm creating an exhibition, I can see it in my mind, and I I know um, I I can't see every painting and how it's arranged on the wall, but I just have a sense of of the kind of fulfillment of that idea. Uh, watermarks, I'm surprised it was so big, I hadn't realized. Um, but the reason, that I wanted it to be from the frozen icebergs of Greenland. It was about water in all its forms. So it's from the frozen icebergs of Greenland all the way through to the boiling, what we call geys geysers, and you call geysers. In, <laughs> I know geysers are old people, I'm a geyser. They're geysers. <laughs> um, the, um, to the boiling geysers in, in Yellowstone. And so, and it was swamps and it was waterfalls and it was rivers and it was underwater and it was water in all its forms. And so until I got water in all its forms, it wasn't finished. Ice and Fire, I'd called it Ice and Fire, uh, that was the title. And all I got for many months or many years, actually three years, all I got was either an erupting volcano like on Montserrat, which, which wasn't a fiery volcano, it was simply putting out pyroclastic flows, which are like rolling, fast rolling um, um, avalanches of superheated steam and rock, but aren't, they don't flame, there aren't flames and fire coming out of it, um, but spectacular, but not fire. Uh, and I'd got plenty of icy volcanoes from Bolivia and from all sorts of places, wonderful, wonderful icy volcanoes. But what I hadn't got was any fire. And so when I went to, um, uh, I thought, well, if I go to Hawaii, perhaps I'll stand a good chance. And I got those wonderful paintings of, of the, of the uh, magma rolling into the sea and you know, steam coming up and all that horrible sulfur that you breathe in and those little tiny needles that you get into your lungs. I got plenty of those. But, but what I didn't get was any fire until I was there, the last day I was there. And I spoke to, because I was working with the volcanologists in Hawaii, and, um, and I said, look, where am I likely to see fire? And they said, well, on the, on the, on the edge of Kilauea, uh, there's a little volcano called Pu'u'u'u. -o -o. And, whoa, it's erupted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they said, we think, we think from the tremors that that might go. And so I hiked out across this hot lava uh, to a little tiny, it's, how, it's strange how... Uh, lava misses certain places, and it had missed a little piece of rainforest. So I sat in this rainforest, and there was Pu'u'u'u, -o -o, which was just a little pimple on the edge of Kilauea, just smoking, looking quite dismal, really. And I thought, what a miserable little thing. And, and, 
And so I thought, well, I'd better draw it and do a bit of painting. So I, I drew it, and it was, wasn't very exciting. Uh, and it was sort of drizzling, and I went into my tent and lay down and thought, well, this was the last night I'm here in Hawaii. I haven't really got anything exciting. And then, blow me, I, I woke up about an hour later. The whole sky was alight with this thing having gone off. And, and it was just like watching the most expensive fireworks display you've ever seen in your life. And so I painted all night. Um, Pu'u O'O, is that what's on the screen? Yes, painted it all night, um, until, well, until about five in the morning when just out of total exhaustion I lay down and then as soon as it got light I put in the finishing touches and rolled it up and hiked back across this molten lava uh, back to my truck and went and stayed with some friends and, and uh, drank a bottle of champagne and thought, that's ice and fire is finished. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> And you also sometimes return to a place to paint it multiple times. And for example, you've painted the Colorado three times and um, hiked in the American Southwest almost innumerable times, though Eileen and I are definitely trying to count them all. Mm -hmm. Oh, tally good. All yes. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As part of an archival project we've undertaken. But could you tell us about this series? Yes. Um, well, the thing is, it's irresistible, isn't it, when somebody says, Would well, you want to come and raft the Colorado? What are you going to say, no? I mean, <laughs> of course you're not. You're going to say yes, no matter how many times you've done it. And in fact, Heraclitus III, uh, uh, I never know if Heraclitus or Heraclitus, the great Greek f philosopher who said, no one can ever step in the same river twice. And of course, the fact that I've rafted the Colorado three times doesn't mean you've worn it out. It means that it's constantly changing. It's always interesting. The, every journey is different, even though it's, you know, the, the, the same, ra the same uh, rapids are there, but they're changing too. And so everything changes all the time. That's the whole point of what he said. And, and so uh, in this case, um, I did it, the first time I did it, I did a 16-day self-guided journey with some friends who are very good rafters and know how to do it. Um, and it was a 16-day paddle raft event, and it was just magnificent. I did a painting every day. Uh, 16 paintings which were bought by, a whole lot were bought by Denver Art Museum um, who unfortunately don't exhibit them very often because they're too worried about them fading which is a bit boring really but um, I mean they want them to last 500 years who cares really I mean <laughs> <laughs> just show them to people let people enjoy them um, and then um, an, old, an old lawyer in Phoenix emailed me and said would I like to come on a Colorado journey I said yeah I'd love to so he said, provided you provide the, give the rafters, uh, the raft outfitters, this was with outfitters, if you give them a little painting, you don't need to pay. So, so um, I went with him. Uh, Ed Lowry, his name was. He's an old lawyer from, from um, Phoenix. And he'd rafted, done the same raft journey on the river for 50 years. I went with him on his 50th year. He hadn't missed a single year for 50 years. Uh, and by then he was in his late 70s, I think, or early 80s. Uh, and then he phoned me again in Tower or emailed me again in Tower Death and said, you don't happen to know a watercolorist in Tower Death who might want to come on the Colorado again, do you? And I said, yes, of course I do. <laughs> and so I went with him on his 52nd journey uh, and did that series there. And that's the series that Yale Centre for British Art have taken into their permanent collection. Um, and I think, that was, I think that was Ed's last journey because uh, he, by then, I think he was 84 then. And... Um, but he was a legend on the river. Everybody knew him. Um, all, the ra all the boatmen know it, knew him. All the professional rafters knew him. And, uh, and so it was a sort of celebratory last journey for him, which is a wonderful thing to join in on. Mm -hmm. Great privilege. Was that answered the question? Yeah, I suppose That's it was. Beautiful. Sort of. mm -hmm. Yes, okay. They were lovely pieces. Uh, I've been interested uh, studying your work in how it's evolved over the years. Here we have a picture on the left of the artwork we were mentioning earlier, a four-day walk of 56.4 miles from 1981. And this is part of Tony's most recent journey that was just exhibited in, um, at Gail Severs Gallery in Ketchum, Idaho. And so just to compare and contrast, I wonder if you could comment on the transitions you've made over the years and why. Yes. Well, I'm a better painter now than I was then. Um, <laughs> but then I ought to be, didn't I, all the practice I put in. Um, uh, and I guess what, hap what happens was, 
in this one, in the first one, um, the narrative was probably much more prominent. Uh, it, it contained jokes. It contains little um, uh, stamps of buses when we took a bus between one place and another because we got bored with walking. And, and, and it's more of a, a sort of narrative about people just having a good time, really. Um, and the landscape elements of it um, are not very accomplished. I mean, they're not very distinguished paintings. And so, and so I probably felt that I had to surround it with all sorts of other material to distract people from the fact that they weren't, they weren't, <laughs> weren't actually very good paintings. Um, the hand-drawn maps are quite yeah, the detailed are, and beautiful. Yeah, I know, really. and, yeah. and I used to do a lot of that stuff, but in the end I realized it would drive me insane. And so I thought, why am I doing this when the maps that I've got are much better drawn anyway? Um, <laughs> And so um, I sort of stopped doing that. But, um, and so I suppose the landscape element became much more and more important because what I was trying to do was to sum up either the day's experiences or the week's experience or the month's experience in one really significant, um, significant landscape. And sometimes now uh, I'll spend, I know I did a big Grand Canyon painting and I spent 13 days just looking for the right site. Just, I had my friends with me. I don't travel alone very often and, unless I have no choice. Uh, I had my friends with me and we would hike out, bushwhack out onto the end of some remote mesa in the Grand Canyon after looking at the maps and saying, well, this ought to be, work pretty well here. Look, if, you, you know, if we can get out onto that point there, surely we get a view down this way and so on. And we would hike out onto the end and I'd look at it and go, sorry guys, this doesn't work. And they'd say, what the hell's wrong with it? And I'd say, well, it just, it's never going to make a big painting. And for a big painting, it's like writing an opera. You know, you can't have enormous dull passages in it. You, uh, I mean, you can if you're Wagner, but otherwise, <laughs> you can't. Uh, <laughs> otherwise you can't. And, 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 a, and a big painting is like that. You can't have vast areas which are just boring. Uh, and, and it's hard to tell that until you actually get and look at them. Uh, and, so, and so big paintings take a great deal more um, foot slogging and thinking and hard work and planning than doing little ones. And I guess at this stage, when I was doing the little things here, or doing this painting on the left, um, it didn't take much planning. I, I phoned my mates or my brother and, and a couple of friends, and I'd say, hey, you want to come and hike across Dartmoor? And they'd go, oh, yeah, all right, when should we go? Next weekend, okay. And, and we put on our backpacks and off we would go and we would get to wherever we got to. We wouldn't care wh how far we got, we wouldn't care uh, if we caught the bus home. It didn't matter, we just went out for a walk. Whereas, whereas when you start um, really thinking about doing some major piece of work, which is gonna take a hell of a long time uh, to do, and a lot of planning, and a lot of traveling, and a lot of expense in order to get to the start of the thing, then you, it seemed to me that you had to produce something which was a much greater, which had much greater impact than the simple ramblings of of uh, someone away for the weekend. And I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I guess that's probably it. It does, and early on, this piece doesn't show up, but some of your early works have little um, plastic pouches with brass um, brads holding the objects that you've collected, like yeah. organic material, or whatever, to them. And then now you're using little um, jewel boxes, more or less. Yeah, and yeah. had an interesting comment about that. Well, I think, I think what it was, the stuff I used to collect originally was deliberately banal stuff. Just a bit of sand or dust or, I don't know, fox turd or whatever it was. It was just, whatever, just deliberately banal and un, uninteresting. Just to say this is the stuff of the land. Uh, this is what we traveled through. You know, this is what I scraped off my boots. Um, but now, I, I began to think that was a little dismissive of, of the actual formation of the landscape. And, and that, in fact, by putting it into a little jewel box, you're turning it into a precious object. And I think it's the preciousness of what we all, the planet we inhabit, which is the important message to take away. And, and, and so by kind of isolating some little object, little stone or a little, I don't know, some little twig or some little fir cone or whatever it is, some aspen leaf, uh, and you look at it much more carefully if it's in a little jewel box. You think about it more carefully. And, and so it's trying to make, make some sort of comment about how these things are precious. Mm -hmm. And then early on you had the ink stamping uh, yeah. kind of shorter notes about your trip, where you slept and where you went. And now 
there's quite a long diary, and you note in your um, handwritten recollections of where you were when you were painting that day, and you note who you were with, too. So I right. thought that's an interesting transition, because you're with people, but yeah. they have seem to be incorporated more into the yeah. reflections. I, I suppose what it is, uh, being British, of course, we're naturally reticent, a re naturally reticent race. We're not, we're, not, we don't, you know, we're not very demonstrative. I mean, the whole idea of hugging, for God's sake, men hugging? I mean, <laughs> what are, what's the matter with you? I mean, I remember the first, when I came to America and I, I did that hugging thing, and I thought, oh, yeah, actually, this is quite nice. I quite, <laughs> this, this, seems, this seems really, really close, and, and I like it. And so I went home and gave my dad a hug, well, it was like giving a, <laughs> it was like hugging a roll of barbed wire. I mean, I mean, he kind of recoiled. As a, Are you all right, lad? And, I, <laughs> and uh, but and, and so I suppose, in a way, you guys have infected me. In that, in that, in that, at first it was simply terse, little, stamped, you know, a bit like a, a an officer's log in a ship's log or something. You know, wind 42 northeast, blah blah blah, sailed 14 degrees west that kind of thing, nothing personal. Whereas now it's become much more personal. I value my friends who come with me. Um, they're extraordinarily, extraordinarily um, important to me. And I think the very least I can do is to mention the fact they were on the journey. Uh, and, um, and so they are intensely personal now. And uh, they're personal things about my one little Englishman's traveling across, um, across these wild places. And, and I couldn't do it on my own, um, most of the time anyway. And so, uh, you know, and it's about, what I'm hoping is that not only are they intensely personal, but they're also universal. If, if you have ever hiked, or if you've ever traveled, or if you've ever just taken a slow walk through somewhere beautiful, then you might respond to, okay, you may be not attacked by a bear, but, but on the other hand, you do notice how beautiful the aspen leaves are. You do notice these things, and so, and so they be, perhaps become personal to you too, or at least convey that sense that what we're doing is, is paying attention, and, that I, and that's what I'm trying to convey. Mm -hmm. We collected photographs of you working in the 1986 on your John Muir's High Sierra oh, yeah. journey, and in the Grand Canyon and also underwater in the Maldives. And I wonder if you could briefly describe your materials that you use and how they tradition. And I'm particularly intrigued where I always see Tony carrying that heavy wood drawing board with him in his hand in the Grand Canyon, Sierra Nevada. And yeah. he made a very clever uh, <laughs> uh, handiwork somewhere along the way. I don't know when, but he figured out a way to lighten that. Yeah. Um, well, of course, the whole thing. It, oops. Anybody who's ever hiked will know that you resent every single ounce that you have to carry. <laughs> and so I'll do anything to lighten my load. I'll cut all the labels off my tea bags. I'll, I've, I've, cut the, I've cut the handle off my mug. I've cut the handle off my toothbrush. I'll do anything to save a quarter of an ounce. And, and, but it doesn't look like it, does it, on that one on the left? <laughs> there I'm, and in fact, walking through the Sierra Nevada with that thing, um, lots of hikers, my fellow hikers, when I met them, would say, "What the hell is that?" And I say, "It's a, it's a folding picnic table," and, then, <laughs> and, then, and I, I couldn't add. If I went into, "Well, it's a folding drawing board," then I'd have to explain that I was doing paintings, and, and I just thought, and, and, it, and so they are convinced they saw this mad Englishman carrying, <laughs> carrying a folding drawing uh, picnic table. But, um, but anyway, I did devise a way of making it fold into three so it would fit onto a backpack instead of under my arm. That was a great advance. And then I realized that if you routed out the back of it, made it out of marine ply, routed out the back, you could make it about half the weight. And now I have a friend in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, who's a cabinet maker, who's traveled with me a couple of times. He actually, he first started, I met him when he was eight. And, um, and when he was eight, he said, Tony, can I come on one of your journeys? I said, well, Mark, you can when you're old enough. How, how old do I have to be? And I said, I think you'd better be 20. And so sure enough, when he was 20, got in touch. Tony, can I come on one of your journeys? And, and, he, and, he, and he came on two, he's been on two or three, and his wife, delightful wife, came too. And, and we had a wonderful time. And anyway, he, handy for me, uh, is a very fine cabinet maker, and he makes my drawing boards for me. Um, and this is my paint box. Um, 
as you've seen in the cabinet outside, I'm sure, all the paintings I do are made with this tiny, tiny paint box. Um, uh, even back in the studio, I'm so used to it that I never use any other one. Um, and it's a Winsor Newton Bijou number two. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's um, crammed with, crammed with color, uh, 21 different colors in there. And those, those little pastels of color there, or little, they're like little sweets, really. Um, they'll last a very, very long time. I mean, it's just extraordinary what value for money they are. Um, and so, uh, I'm not paid by Winsor Newton to say this, um, but anyhow, so that's my paint box. It doesn't weigh much. It's less than the size of a cigarette packet. Um, uh, and you'll see, so the first one you can see, there's a, a kind of much younger Foster, foolhardy, carrying all that stuff. The second one, you can see I've built the easel on site. I built it out of downed trees. I had a saw, a little, a little, you know, one of those little bits of wire that's got saw teeth on it. Sawed my way through some downed trees and built that easel there, like a five-bar gate, really, um, and lashed it all together, right on the edge of the Grand Canyon. And it needed to be that heavy, actually, because Hurricane Ivan uh, was just kind of petering out over there, and the wind was howling, absolutely howling. And there I was. On the right on the edge of the Grand Canyon, on the North Rim, um, in a place called Point Sublime. And um, I can remember, uh, and I had my tent a little further back, uh, but not much further back, and the tent I thought was going to blow away, but it never, I lay in it to stop it blowing away. And I left the easel there, of course. I used to roll the painting up every evening and put it in that aluminium tube, um, which is what all my paintings are carried in. Um, and. Uh, uh, one day, two Swedish, I think they were Swedish or Swiss, they came uh, to the end and looked over the edge for a few minutes and then they saw, came back and I was sitting having my lunch. And, um, and they, they said, uh, have you told anyone about that at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, canyon? And I said, about what? And they said, that uh, shelter there, do you think some hippies put that up? And they, <laughs> they, thought, they thought it was a hippie shelter. And I, I said... <laughs> I said, no, it's a drawing board. It's, it's put there by the National Park in case any artists want to come past. Them. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so that's the kind of phase two. Uh, and then this one, of course, is, is working underwater, which does seem like lunacy, really. But on the other hand, I reckon it works pretty well. I think the paintings <laughs> look, look pretty nice. And, um, I like it that you still use your metal clips. Oh, yeah, the, same clips. Um, yeah. <laughs> they get a little rusty after being yeah. <laughs> immersed in salt water for a while, but yeah, same old stuff, really. Thank you. So I find one of the things uh, remarkable about you and inspirational is the way you connect and then stay collect connected with people you've met along your sojourns. And of course, there's been a long, strong tie of friendship and support throughout your life tying these adventures together. And this begins at home with your wife, Anne, who is also an artist. Uh, they met as mere teenagers at a mutual friend's basement party on Valentine's Day a couple years ago. And <laughs> Anne, Anne shares your aesthetic values, uh, but not your yearning for long periods in the wilderness. <laughs> and then your brother, Steve, has joined you on several adventures. But what's amazing is Tony's also formed very long, deep friendships with people he's just met along the trail. And I'm curious if you can describe how that happens sometimes. It's just fortuitous, but I guess you're open to the connection or something about you working and painting. People come up yeah. and talk to you about what you're doing. I think what happens is that, that as a painter, um, as an artist, really, people are intrigued by what you do. Uh, they can't quite understand how you do it, and they can't see the kind of magic that you create which it does seem like magic to some people. Um, but, they, but it's intriguing and also it's harmless. Uh, it's not as if you're shooting things and it's not as if you're trying to steal anything and it's not as if you're about to attack anybody. You're not about to cut a tree down. You're, you're just sitting there quietly kind of absorbed in the place. And, and people respond very directly to that. Uh, and it's led to extraordinary encounters throughout my life, some of which, as you say, have re remained lifelong friends um, and a friendship that you make when you get into or go into difficult difficult places with people for long periods of time is like no other friendship I think um, the only thing I could associate it with I suppose is perhaps 
when my dad was in the Air Force during the Second World War and, and the friendships he made, uh, you know, flying bombers over Germany every night. Um, those were people you relied on. Well, it's not quite as dramatic as that, thank goodness. But on the other hand, there are people that you have to absolutely know you can trust. And, and so you do encounter these people very often in similar places. They're very often doing similar things to what you're doing, except they're not painting. But they do, uh, I mean, people like uh, my dear friend who died, everybody seems to die when you get to my age, um, uh, who died about uh, two, three months ago, Winslow Briggs, who was the director of the, of the Carnegie Institute, Institute of Plant Biology at Stanford, another very, very famous scientist, won the Japan Prize, which was given by the Emperor of Japan because he discovered that the Nobel Prize didn't actually have a prize for biology. And he was a very famous biologist, and so he was given the Japan Prize. And, and I bumped into him on the, on the John Muir Trail, him and his wife Anne and his daughter Marion. And um, they were doing the trail with a pack llama, uh, which sounds like a good idea. A llama will carry about 25 pounds, um, it's quiet, doesn't damage the landscape. Um, but on the other hand, it will only do eight miles a day, and then it will s just stop, and it will fold its legs under it like a folding drawing board, <laughs> and a, a folding uh, ironing board, you know, sort of collapsing iron board, and just that is the end of it. It will not move after that. And so, although I was moving slowly because I was painting, uh, and, as well as hiking, of course, um, they were moving slowly because of the llama, and so we were sort of leapfrogging each other <laughs> all the way down the John Muir Trail, 215 miles, and by the end of it, of course, we were firm friends. And so, um, and so he, that was from 1986, I think, and we were friends ever since. And we hiked together, we did some fairly remote travels together, and he was one of my great friends and supporters. And so, once you get friends like that, you, unless you're foolish, you're not gonna give them up. Um, and I've got a book with names and addresses, and when I think, I wonder who wants to come to Everest. I, I have a number of, nists, uh, of names, and I phone people and say, hey, do you fancy six weeks in Everest? And they go, when is it going to be? And I say, oh, yeah, May next year. Oh, oh, I might be able to. Yeah, let me think about it. And Anyway, that way I collect together gangs of my friends to travel with. And, of course, they make life easier for me. They sometimes do the cooking. They, you know, they go off and catch a fish for us to eat. Uh, and so... Um, they're just wonderful people to travel with and we trust each other and that's the main thing. And in one case, it's been three generations of people that you've been in <laughs> touch with. They're like touchstones and then uh, traveling companions also. Right, that's true. Yeah. So I wanted to point out, it's funny we're talking about friendships and all the long ties Tony's made and here you look so isolated here, but I wanted to point out somebody took those pictures, right? So he was with people. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. I call that num, num bum rock. It's not really called that, but it's just a... <laughs> After, after, I sat, after I sat on it for now four it days, that. and it was rather sharp, I had a numb bum. But, um, and, and this one, um, and that was taken by Bill Vanderbilt, a very great friend who I've traveled with many times. And he was, well, we both camped at the end there of the gates of the mountains. And I would canoe up to here every, or he would canoe me up there to every day. And then he would go off and climb mountains or explore leaving me stranded on this rock, like, uh, uh, who was it stranded on a rock? I can't remember. But anyway, um, and then this one, um, yes, I, I, this is in Guyana, um, three, three or four days upriver in a little boat to get to, and then climb up onto the plateau to get to Kaichua Falls. Uh, and my friend, um, my friends, uh, Mike and Viv Nathan, uh, and, and they had worked in Guyana. Uh, he, he, he worked for the World Health Organization in, um, they don't call it mosquito eradication, they call it vector control, they call it, um, because they know they can't, they can't eradicate mosquitoes and actually probably don't want to, uh, but they do like to think they can at least get them down a bit and do away with a lot of the mosquito, a lot of the malaria and so on. And so he'd been working in, in, in Guyana for about three years, I think, and so when I said I was doing a series about water, he said, you must go to Kaichua Falls. And so I said, well, I will if, you, if you'll come with me. And so we all went together, he and his wife and, his, and their son, Charles, uh, and had the adventure of getting to Kaichua Falls. And then they, they left me there and went back down to Georgetown and flew home. They weren't living there anymore. 
uh, and uh, leaving me there for a month to work on uh, three paintings of Kaichou Falls. Uh, so you've connected with the places you've painted in a deeper way too, not only um, the, with the people, but also by recording and only recording them, but also you've been very philanthropic. Uh, and I wanted to point out this whole school. There's kind of a funny story behind that, but you, um, he has a school named after him in Honduras. Yep. And uh, painted a jacle that's a fundraiser uh, after the Nepal earthquake in 2015, because Tony's been to um, trekking in the Himalayas a number of time and wanted to help the Sherpas that he's friends with there. And also um, John Muir Trust. Right. Makes me sound like a saint, doesn't it? Um, um, but yes, I'll be brief because I don't think it does to blow one's own trumpet, really. Um, but that, what happened was, um, after Hurricane Mitch, which struck Honduras, a friend of mine who was working in the rainforest in Honduras with the local people on a sustainable agriculture project, which is highly successful, um, had come back to the UK and he'd, he'd said about how the people he was working with, their houses had been blown away uh, and lots of money had been sent down to Honduras, a lot by Americans, uh, but of course it had mostly gone to the cities, which is perfectly understandable. A lot of people were in real desperate states, states in the cities. And the people in the rainforest were kind of left just to get on with it. Um, and so they're all living in one hut, the whole village in one hut. And so he was thought, and I said, well, I'll see if I can raise some money. So I gave some lectures and raised a sum of money. I can't remember how much, a few thousand pounds. Um, and Mike took it out, changed it to dollars, went to, went to Miami, bought tin sheeting and cement and had it shipped to Honduras, got it out into the rainforest. And he phoned me a few weeks later and said, well, you might be pleased to know you've re-roofed the entire village. And I said, oh, that's great. Well, smashing. And he said, he said, but there was some money left over and we had a village meeting and asked them what they wanted to do with it. And they said, well, they'd like a television set. And, <laughs> and when I pointed out they hadn't got electricity, <laughs> then they said, well, oh, perhaps we could have a school. The children haven't got a school. We should have a school. So he said they want to build their own school, but they can't afford... Uh, the, the tin sheeting for the roof, they can't afford the cement, they can't afford to pay the man with the chainsaw to log up the trees which have been felled, um, to plank up the, the trees that have been felled in the hurricane. So could you raise a bit more money? So I said, okay, I'll try. So I raised some more money uh, and sent it out. And then um, in order to thank me for that, uh, the people of the village organized this trip down the Platano River through the rainforest. It was a 14-day trip through primary, absolutely beautiful primary rainforest. And, uh, we, um, and Jorge and Rosendo were our two guides. Uh, Jorge was a Mosquite Indian and Rosendo was a Pesh Indian, uh, perfectly used to living in the rainforest, but not particularly used to rafting. And so, we, ha we had rafts hauled up to the headwaters of the, of right through the forest. Uh, um, horses took up the rafts. We inflated them. We jumped in the rafts. We came down, and after about 20 minutes, we came to a waterfall that everybody had forgotten about. And, <laughs> and, and the, the, um, the front of the raft tipped over this. It wasn't a big waterfall. It was probably only 20 feet, but nonetheless, it was a sheer drop. And the front of the raft tipped, and, and uh, uh, Chris, the second one from the right on the bottom there, Chris Mazzola, uh, society dentist, um, he, he and I were sitting in the back of the raft and the back of the raft flipped like that and we flew through the air together like a pair of trapeze artists <laughs> and splash into the water. Well, our paddles got washed away and, and anyway, Chris managed to grab both paddles. One of my tevas got what, washed off my foot and so ever afterwards, the entire journey, I had one teva and one soggy boot. So by the end of it, I got trench foot in this, in this leg here. Um, but anyhow, uh, and so we got off to a flying start with this trip. Um, and, and, uh, but anyway, uh, everybody at the end of it, uh, we finally came through the Mosquitia, which is a big swampy area um, where everybody lives sort of in canoes, really. Uh, and then the Mosquito Indians live in canoes there. And then we came to the Caribbean and we all jumped in with all our clothes on and, you know, just relieved that we'd actually fin finished the thing. 
Um, but anyway, uh, and so everybody else went home except me, because uh, I was doing a bit more painting. And, um, uh, and then Mike, my friend Mike, who's a second in from the right there, who was doing the... the, the um, no, he, no, it's a different Mike. Okay. This one's doing the, the um, uh, alley cropping, the, the um, stopping slash and burn, making a sustainable agriculture. Uh, he said, well, uh, we want you to come to the opening of the school. And I said, well, no, I've finished my work now. I want to go home. And, and he said, well, and I phoned my wife, who actually knew this, but I didn't. She knew this school had been named after me, and I didn't know that. Uh, and, um, and so I said, look, I'm coming home early. And she said, oh, really? And, I, and, I, and I, I said, well, uh, yeah. I said, I've finished all the work I want to do. I'm, I can come home a week early. She said, well, aren't you going to the opening of the school? And I said, no, they don't need me. They, they, they're, you know, they've built their school. They're very happy about it. And they don't need me there. And, and she said, well, I think they'll think that you're a real snob because you're too proud to go to the opening of this school. I thought, gosh, I, I can't have that. I'm no snob. And so... And so I said, oh, do you think so? uh, Yeah, honestly, she said, I think, I think you should go. I think it would be terribly bad form not to go. So I said, oh, OK. So I stayed, and, and Mike and I went up. And we were sitting, and there was a big banquet that had been laid out on the veranda of this beautiful, beautiful school that they built. It was built out of mud block, which had dried out in the sun. Then they built this, this school. Then they'd, then they'd cement rendered it. They'd roofed it. And it was the biggest, by far the biggest building in the village. Um, and they were so proud of it, as they should have been. It was just fantastic. Uh, anyway, I had a lovely veranda, and there were long tables laid out, and the local mayor was there, though he'd showed no interest in the place up until that point. The local politician, who'd shown even less interest, was suddenly there, and everybody was chatting, uh, giving great flowery speeches. Oh, Esqueli Clinica Tony Foster, Esqueli Clinica Tony Foster. And Mike had said to me, you're going to have to make a speech. So I'd laboriously written out this speech in Spanish about, um, you know, I was pleased they got their school. And then suddenly I realized it was actually named after me. So I had to suddenly change my speech, you know, <laughs> about what a great honor. Oh, mi corazón. You know, um, and, and, and of course, it was a great honor. I mean, it's one of the greatest honors of my entire life. And, um, and so, um, so and, and they didn't unveil the, the notice. They had a sheet over it, and, and they didn't unveil it until, you know, Everybody had realized that that's what it was called. And they said, well, we didn't do that because we thought when you came into the village, you'd be so embarrassed that you'd turn around and go away again. <laughs> and, 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 uh, but anyway, we had a big party, and, um, and it was a, just a huge success. And so I continued to raise money to keep the school going and to buy books and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, what are we talking so about now? Now we're going to talk about um, after painting in these remote parts of the world for nearly 40 years, including Honduras, which was in that previous slide, Yellowstone and other areas. Can you talk about some of the changes you've seen? Um, uh, well, this is a good example. I was in Yellowstone only a week ago. And um, when I did this painting of Prismatic Pool, it's from a sort of elevated position on the quiet side of the, of the uh, Firehole River. And I walked along the Firehole River on a little track actually walked uh, two miles into the forest uh, to camp and would walk back every day uh, and climb, scramble up this hill, uh, sort of um, a, a sort of 45 degree hill, and, um, and then kind of flattened a little area to put my stool on and sat there and did this painting. And when I went back there a week ago, the, road, the path had been graveled, there must have been 200 people on it, and I, I walked along it, uh, and I discovered a, a set of steps made out of stone going up and up and up, and then a little platform with a fence around it and all sorts of notices saying, don't throw yourself over the edge, and, <laughs> and all sorts of useful advice like that. And, and it was the exact spot where I painted. And I thought, wow, I hope I wasn't responsible for this, um, because it has suddenly become a tourist attraction. And... and you know, Yellowstone is, is have hellish trouble trying to cope with the press of people who've just come to adore the place. And, and you know, of course, it's marvelous that they do, but I remember sitting what, this time watching um, Old Faithful go off, and we all sat and watched, or you know, sat, you know, for 20 minutes until it was ready to go, and, uh, you know, but it was pretty patient, and then surely bang on time, up it went. 
But I noticed that a good number of the people, having sat there for half an hour waiting for it, actually didn't wait for it to finish. They, you know, two or three minutes before it finished, they rushed off because they didn't want to get caught in the traffic, leaving. And I thought, there's really something wrong with this. Um, but anyhow, so, uh, and Honduras, where, where we just talked about, you saw us there perched on that rock, which was carved with ancient carving. Nobody knows which civilization carved that or when. Nobody knows anything about it. But several of the rocks we came across were carved with these indecipherable language of some sort. Nobody knew anything about it. Um, but now, you couldn't go in there without the army because it's so overrun with drug dealers, illegal loggers, uh, people mining for gold, people mining for all sorts of other stuff, uh, and, and enormous amounts of drugs and so on. Uh, people, uh, armed gangsters everywhere. You could only go in now with the army. Well, that's, it. that's supposed to be a World Heritage Site. And that's in a period of, what, 15 years. So these places are seriously under threat and easily swept away. That's one of the most beautiful rainforests I've ever seen. And yet, it can be gone in an instant, really. It's quite a balance between sharing the wilderness sites with the people around and getting them to care about them and protect them I and know. having them. I know. And, that, and that's, of course, the dilemma I have. You know, people see my paintings and think, oh, it would be lovely to go there. And so it would be. Um, but don't everybody go. And, and <laughs> just. I, I always think that, you know, if people see my paintings, that would be enough to make them want to preserve these places. But, of course, people naturally want to go and see for themselves. And, and you can't stop people. You can't blame them. I don't blame them. Uh, you know, I, who am I to say you can't go? I mean, I've been to wonderful places. I've been very, very fortunate. So it's a tough one. I have no answer for that. What are your hopes when people see and experience your art? I hope they'll buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, partly that, but, <laughs> um, but no, what I hope, of course, is that, is that uh, like I say, wilderness is all under threat. The world is, exp the people are expanding in the world. Everything becomes more and more under pressure. Um, and then there are kind of spurious, spurious it seems to me, uh, excuses for uh, doing away with wilderness in the interests of, of uh, fat cats all over the world. Uh, which I despise utterly. Um, and so there are all sorts of reasons why people are attacking wilderness. And what I'm hoping is that when people see my paintings, at least that's one small argument in favour of keeping them um, and just leaving them alone. Because it always seemed to me that a mark of civilization is not how many of these places you can flatten and use for things, but how many of these places you're prepared to leave alone. It's a, a mark of intelligence and civilization just to leave them alone. That's what I hope, but who knows. And here we are at the Foster, a wonderful venue where people from around the world, really from around the world, come to see your truly beautiful work of your life's passion. passion. So thank you, Tony, for making your life all about journeys and sharing your vision and reflections with us tonight. <laughs> You're very welcome. Yes, well, there, people want to, yes. If, are people willing to listen to just a couple of questions? There are a couple of technical questions I thought I would ask, and then uh, we'll just go for maybe five or ten minutes. Are and these then, from the audience now? Yes, from the okay, audience. Okay, good. And these are yours, then, right? So these stay. These are yours. And, uh, and then after that, uh, just enjoy Tony's artwork, and the galleries will be open until 8.30. But um, somebody writes, I love all of your works and especially some of your earlier works such as Mount Katahdin and from a ridge below Ants Basin that include wildlife portraits in margins or insects. Do you have any plans to do more work in that style in current or future journeys? Well, the marginalia, as you might call it, depends really on what I see and what attracts me and what interests me as I'm doing the journey. So um, sometimes it, it's about the basis of a landscape, what, what it is that, about that landscape that makes it interesting. The series that I did in, in, in uh, Ketchum or Sun Valley recently, the whole elements of all the paintings really were about the aspens turning to a brilliant yellow, the willows turning to a slightly different yellow, and the rocks and a bit of snow. And so, and so all the souvenirs on those were either were, were a combination of those things. 
But sometimes, like in the rainforest, you know, you'd be foolish if you don't take note of the fact that the whole place is teeming with wildlife. And so, and so very often I will include all sorts of things about that. But the reason I don't actually put birds flying on the paintings or, or through the paintings or, you know, deer, a herd of deer stampeding across the middle is because the paintings are about time spent in somewhere. They're about time spent, often long periods of time, and absorbing what you see and, and trying to convey the fact that this actually takes a long time. Uh, and so if you have a bird flying across it, it makes it seem like it's a fraction of a second, really, or a fraction of a minute. Or if you have the, you know, the stampeding deer, uh, that, that seems like a very, very short period of time. And the paintings aren't a short period of time. They take a long time to do. And so I very often put them around the edge rather than putting them in the, actually in the painting. And that's why I use that device, really. And yes, I quite often refer to wildlife, and I'll continue to do so, I'm sure, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you mask out white veins, ripples, etc.? How do you make a stormy sky that ends neatly at the horizon? <laughs> oh, gosh, that's a hard one. Um, I guess I'm just a very neat worker. <laughs> I don't know. The, I, uh, I suppose, well, actually, I do know how to do that, of course. Um, because the skies are always done what you guys call wet on wet. Um, I, know, I know nothing about watercolour technique, really. I, 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 I've never read a book on it. I'm not really interested in it. Uh, although I was pleased to, the other day to go to a lecture on Turner's, uh, Britain's greatest watercolourist, uh, Turner's watercolour techniques by one of, his, one of the experts who studied him for a lifetime. And I discovered that I use every one of Turner's, Turner's techniques. But anyway, um, the horizon line, yeah. So what it is, I draw first. I draw everything as much as I can first. And of course, I draw the horizon line or whatever's on the horizon, mountains sticking up, trees sticking up here, whatever it is. And then I wet the paper above that line. And I'm precise about going round that, round all those things. And so then when you flood the, flood the paper and then put the paint into it, which disperses beautifully and creates these wonderful skies, um, it doesn't flood into the landscape itself because there's no water in that bit and so that's the wonder of watercolour you can just paint water around everything and put colour on it and it'll stop wherever you haven't put water and so it's pretty straightforward really although it's less straightforward when you're doing it in the desert and insects keep jumping on it and sucking up the water <laughs> and then you have to paint round the butterflies and things but but anyway the theory is the theory is that it's simple then these two I think I'll just combine. What has been your favorite subject to paint, and what was the most challenging location to paint? Wow, okay. Well, the most, uh, my favorite, I guess, has got to be the Grand Canyon. It's the place I've been back to most often. The reason being, I suppose, it is so magnificent. It is changing all the time. It is constantly, it recreates itself in front of your eyes because you do a drawing, and you think that something that appears to stick out of the North Rim a little bit uh, and you've drawn that, and then suddenly, two hours later, you realize this is an immense mountain, really, which has separated itself from, because the light has changed. Everything changes all the time, and it's the most magic, magic place. Wonderful just to watch that process. Uh, so I've been to the Grand Canyon many times and spent many, many months there. Um, most challenging has got to be Everest. Um, I, one of the occasions I spoke about when I nearly died, one of them was on Everest. And, and I've painted all three sides of Everest. Nobody else has ever done that. In fact, very few people have ever seen the east face of Everest because it's so hard to get to, uh, and even harder to climb, of course. I've never climbed it. Um, but a very, very tough place to get to. Uh, but uh, very, very rewarding. And the most rewarding thing about it is my attachment to the Sherpas. Uh, their Buddhist philosophy has just turned them in as big, means that they are such wonderful, magical people to spend time with. Generous, honest, hardworking, just f fiercely independent, and just beautiful people to become friends with and to, to, to uh, be absorbed into their families, which you always are, because they're just great family people. Um, and so, so very, very rewarding, but also very, very tough. Mm -hmm. So this is a sign of the very friendly audience, an adoring audience you have here tonight. Hello, Tony. When can we expect you to be Sir Tony? <laughs> and, 
And, and what can we do to move this along? Signed, a devoted follower. I think he'll keep this one. I'll keep it. Yeah, I will keep it. Thank you, whoever that devoted follower is. I think, well, we'd better ask the Queen to answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight.